Well, we're going to begin then. What an event. What an evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, most honorable and distinguished guests. Welcome to the opening of the Meditation Museum in our beautiful nation's capital. Tonight's extraordinary event is being broadcast live worldwide, and I kindly ask that you silence your cell phones. And I, I asked you earlier if you wanted to do some tweets, so we already did that. So uh, I, I just want to ask, did anyone guess anyone's names that were on the back during the little icebreaker session we had? Yes. Look, all right, show of hands. Very good. That was a nice little, uh, a nice little treat. That's just great. I'm your host, Portia Davidson, and I want to tell you that I first met Sister Jenna at the Pentagon when I served as the strategic planner for the Army. Sister Jenna was a guest speaker with Deepak Chopra to address an audience of Joint Service Flag Officers and members of the Senior Executive Services. Deepak came out and spoke in matters dealing with the nature of quantum physics and how we're all connected to the universe through atoms, etc. And we were all looking up to the heavens for mutual understanding. He's probably one of the most brilliant men on the earth, but it, it kind of went over everyone's head. But it was when Sister Jenna came out to speak that changed the tempo of everything in the room. Her voice was quiet, and she gently spoke and said, the natural awareness of peace resides in every one of us. And then she said, we cannot change the past or the, or the external stimuli, so if you wish to emerge from your, your original joy and to be more at peace, you have to choose to change your thoughts. Well, the entire audience became silent. And suddenly, everyone started to lean in and listen, <laughs> rather than look up and wonder. It was quite an experience. I, so we went from leaning in, uh, looking up and, and leaning in. And since that day, I've been an active member of the Meditation Museum, and it really has changed my life forever. For many years after meeting the Brahma Kamaras through Sister Jenna and all the other BKs, I've grown to appreciate a special kind of spirituality that I am comfortable with. It's a quiet, simple wisdom which asks us to listen, understand, and embrace a, a connection to the divine. The Brahma Kamaras have shaped this city with their tireless efforts towards a more peaceful and just society, and it's not just here in Washington, D.C. Their presence can be found in 120 countries with over 9,000 branches. That speaks volumes, ladies and gentlemen, about the kind of people, and especially the kind of women who are at the helm of this fascinating spiritual movement. I must say, we are at a time that events like this can help us to reflect on ourselves and help us to mend or better understand what tools are required to empower and build our relationships with others. We have a wonderful evening planned for you tonight. We have uh, many guests uh, in, uh, that represent all areas of expertise who will be joining us for this evening, including congressional and local government officials, friends from the America Meditating Radio Show, acclaimed international opera singer Chrysaline Petropoulos, Marcia Dyson, comedian and storyteller Vijay Nathan, and additional jo voices will join us through video appearances. And I do want to shout out to my good friend, Shizumi Minali, uh, who is a, also a highly acclaimed international filmmaker who just uh, uh, completed her award-winning film, Pictures from a Hiroshima Schoolyard, that she has taken all over the world. So Shizumi and, and all the other guests, we're just delighted to have you here tonight. It is my pleasure now to introduce Sister Jenna. Sister Jenna is an award-winning spiritual leader, author, radio, and television personality, renowned speaker and founder of this meditation museum. For decades, Sister Jenna has demonstrated an extraordinary level of improvement in the quality of lives of people, ranging from heads of government to children and villages. She has traveled to over 80 countries where she continues to provide practical life tools and solutions that empower people to foster and build stronger relationships. She is both a, a powerful presence for peace and a community-oriented spiritual leader. But one of her most valued assets is being a world leader in relationship building. Her wisdom, peace, and compassion for humanity are expressed through the variety of in initiatives she spearheads for youth, women, governments, and communities, and through her syndicated radio show called America Meditating. 
Sister Jenna is the recipient of numerous awards and proclamations, including the President's Lifetime National Community Service Award, Everyday Hero Award by the Foundation for Better Life, and the Friendship Archway Awards, to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please welcome Sister Jenna. Om Shanti. Don't you love all that official stuff? Yeah, it is so nice to see all of you tonight, and um, it's way overdue. I've often wanted to invite quite a lot of our friends and fans over the years to join us all at one time. And each time we try to get into a bigger place, it gets too small. Just look, it's already too small. And here we were thinking that, okay, it'll manage. You know, and so this is the plight of life. So a very heartfelt, exceptionally pure, silent, powerful, and loving greetings to all of you that are present physically and those that are also watching globally. As Portia had mentioned earlier, we have 9,000 branches in 120 countries. That's a lot of places. I have a lot of homes. So when I say that I've traveled to over 88 countries, it's not a big thing. It's just because I have homes everywhere. And I think I'd like to sort of bring things in context, if that's okay. Is that all right? Many, many years ago, <laughs> when um, I was born, it was in a little island in the Caribbean called Jamaica. My dad's Indian and my mother's African. I used to watch my father coming home praising Krishna, who is a god in India. And keep in mind, India has 33 million gods which you can choose from, so you're never bored. Whoa. Now, my mother was Roman Catholic, so she had one. And this particular god hung on a thing, and he would be doing this all the time. And every time she came home, she'd be like, oh, I go, what's the matter? I just came back from church. Oh, OK. And my dad would come home, Hari Krishna, Hari Om. And I'm like, OK, dad, are you OK? Yeah, just come from temple. And it was at that moment, I was the, must have been about four or five, I knew that our interpretation of God was a personal choice. Only because it comes from my eyes, what I saw growing up. And I think that was where it started, this quest or this need to sort of understand why we tick the way that we do and what is the importance of interpretation in our world. A little story about a baby mosquito that was born recently. And the baby mosquito um, was quite enthusiastic to go and explore the world. And the dad said, no, I don't want you to. It is rough out there, and Marcia Dyson and I just shared our passion about the world in service to humanity, and the baby mosquito was saying, but dad, if I don't go out there, how am I going to know what it's about? And dad said, because I've been there, I'm telling you what it's about. You don't need to go. So a few days passed, and he kept annoying his father, and finally dad convinced him, OK, you can go. And in his heart, he knew he wasn't going to come back. So the baby mosquito flew off happily as a lark. Two days, three days, four days passed by. The mosquito didn't come home. Dad knew that was it. On the seventh day, the mosquito came back, and Dad's excited. And Dad goes, are you OK? I cannot believe you're back. And the little baby mosquito looked at Dad and said, wow, Dad, it's like amazing. And Dad says, were they bad to you? Did they hurt you? And the little baby mosquito says, Dad, the world is awesome. Everywhere I went, they kept clapping for me. <laughs> you didn't get that? Oh, it's a delayed reaction. <laughs> the reason why I find the story so important is our interpretation of ourselves is dictating the current events of the world. Our interpretations of each other is dictating the current state of the world. Our interpretation of God dictates the subtle influences that we choose to hold on to and release. 
this meditation museum is a gift from the divine, from the supreme. It's not Sister Jen, it's not the Brahma Kumaris, it's not all the angels that worked tirelessly to put this together. But it's everyone involved where we were thinking and continue to pull the thought of the divine to say, tell us what you want us to do where we can all come together as one and that our interpretation can change. And so the Meditation Museum is a space that everyone can come to, black, white, rich, poor, in, out, up, down, whatever it is that's your preference, this is your place to come and find out who you are. The exhibit, Who Am I, is our latest piece, and there are five forms that we invite you to come back and visit and look at when the space is completely cleared up and there are no more chairs in the room. We are carrying stories, and some of the stories aren't always the most positive, but they have shaped our lives. And this, this is a time that we need to start to let go of stories of pain and sorrow and stop imposing the pain and sorrow on other people. Meditation, spirituality, having a relationship with God and having a relationship with ourselves is not religious. It is the soul's worth and the right thing to do, to bring ourselves back to a place of personal empowerment so that if someone is unkind, I don't have to be influenced by their unkindness. If somebody is loving and sweet, I don't have to be impressed. I will accept, but that's normal behavior now. When's the last time you met a very sweet person who was sweet 99% of the time? It's that's not good. And so we here at the Brahma Kumaris are striving to create communities of individuals who can at least reach 10% sweetness. How's that? 10% is good. And if we get 15 or 20, it's a bonus. And what I'm saying that to you is it's quite a journey inward when you start to change your waste into wonder and the weaknesses that we're carrying in terms of what we would call our inadequate self, uh, where there's anger or ego or lust or greed or jealousy or competition. These energies have robbed the soul of its power. And so here at the Meditation Museum, we're inviting you to put a halt to that. So growing up with a Hindu father and a Roman Catholic mother who's African and being brought up in America has offered me an opportunity to see the world as one. I don't know what it's like to just hang around Jamaicans and say, Yemen. <laughs> and I don't know what it's like to just hang around Indians and say, Kemcho or Abkesehe. You know, I don't know what it's like to just be with one group of people. I have no idea what that feels like. And even in my world of spiritual community, I believe in the invitation of everyone in a space. And so I'm here in front of you as an individual who herself has gone to the wayside and back. And I especially care for so many of those moments where I'm not always the most elevated because I begin to appreciate the path that I'm on because it accepts me as I am, and it gives me time and space to get to my destination. And I hope that makes sense for everyone in the room. And that's what the Brahma Kumaris really offers you as a teaching, as a culture, as an environment. So from the bottom of all of our hearts, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to weather the traffic and come into the space. Did you enjoy the food? Okay. Before I remove myself from the podium, I'd like to call up a few friends to say hello and share some thoughts about their journey with you and um, allow their journey and their travels to guide and help you to reflect at a deeper level. Marcia Dyson and I met many years ago at an event that we attended. I think it was actually ending poverty in Africa at the Washington National Cathedral with Madeleine Albright. I think that was the first one. And we were just sitting there on the stool and we ended up talking to each other and since then we have stayed friends. 
Marcy is a minister, an author, an entrepreneur, an activist, and a woman of a lot of courage and strength. She's tirelessly trying to make a difference to end injustice and the things that hurt the hearts of other people. And without further ado, I'd like to invite my very dear friend, Marcia Dyson, to share a few words with you today. Um, Shanti. Uh, thank you, Sister Jenna. And as Sister Jenna was calmly telling her story and making us laugh, it was really refreshing for me because, you know, as she said, I've really traveled the world. And in her office, I was given what we would call in the African-American church tradition a testimony. I was telling her that in the midst of all my work, uh, just very recently being having an interaction with some of the escapees from the Boko Haram from Nigeria, that those, some of those women, young women, are here in the United States and no one knew. And hearing their stories of escape and hearing the loss of their families overwhelmed me because I also do work in the Middle East and I've been to the refugee camps in Jordan, the Zarachari refugee camp, which is really a concentration camp. And I've been to the occupied territories on the border of Lebanon and Syria, and you see the demise of the people there, and you see the waste of the land, and you see the eradication, the possibility of childhood for the children there. And then I'm home as an African American, and I'm watching television, and I see a black man running and being shot in the back. Or oh, I'm seeing young men, that, uh, young boys that look like my grandchildren being shot innocently, not being able to play on the playground. And yesterday, that crushing of the world's woes made me ill yesterday in my body. I didn't think I was going to live. I really, I told Sister Jen, I felt like I was having a heart attack. My kidneys felt like they were going to burst because of the woes of the world. And I pray in so many different ways uh, as an ordained a uh, non-denominational Christian minister who said the Shahada in Jordan as a now a, a, <laughs> a Shahada as a, as a Muslim who have has said and have participated in seders that nothing could calm me. So before I came here, Sister Jenna, I had to baptize myself in the water. Whenever I'm unresting my soul, I had to take a bath to cleanse myself because normally I don't make it here when Sister Jenna invites me, but I felt my soul needed to be in her presence, to be in your presence because I knew that if you came here tonight, that you had a resource, a reservoir that was going to build me up to do the work, that it's not a burden, but overburden my heart as a human being. So my story is no different than yours. My visions are no greater than yours. My uh, heartaches are no more precious than yours. But I think that we're all here because we don't come to meditate for ourselves. For me, my meditation and the social activism that I do is so that it can strengthen me when I am burdened by all that I see that is happening in the so-called perfected world of God going imperfect, that I can mediate properly and with calm and with quality response with everything that's happening to the world and the things that we can learn in the meditative center like this is to make sure that we are centered so that all those things that fray my soul, I'm speaking, I'm testifying for myself, is not put out into the world so that my true testimony of wanting to help on a sincere, authentic level is not being reached. It's hard to say that you want to be a candle because there are so many winds that can blow you out. You don't know if you're going to be a candle where your wax is burning and there's nobody else to build you up, to put more wax around the wick to which you have. You don't know what color of candle you're going to be, what kind of light you are going to be, because candles can mean a whole lot of things. I know that candle can mean romance. Candles can be in a place where there's no lights, like in the midnight hours of Haiti, to take you to a safe place, even to find fresh water. Candles can be a signal to tell a terrorist to come in, now is the time to go. So depending upon what kind of light we are is really is the kind of receptability that we will have in the world. And so though I have traveled with presidents, and though I have interfaced with first ladies, and though I have worked with almost every civil rights activist there is in the United States, it really came down to me centering myself today, a broken woman, 
trying to do so-called God's work or the work of the divine, feeling like she herself was going to die because I can't keep the mind, uh, my head or my mind or my eyes off the little Kurdish girl that I saw in a video of a documentary who was stuck on the mountain someplace with no water. But I know that we're not to carry all of the world's burdens with us, but it's the fact that I think that in carrying that, it first and foremost allows me to know how blessed I am, how fortunate I am to be here. But it still will allow me to say that we are not an island unto ourselves, whether you're from Jamaica, mine, you know, or Long Island, mine, off the Keys of Florida, mine, or Cuba, mine. It's, it's not that we're an island to ourselves. We are someone unto ourselves, belonging to the vine, to always, even when our candles, whatever kind of candle it is, is blown out, that we got to find some kind of way of being relit. This morning in my meditation, I tweeted about what I thought love was like. And I tweeted, and I may not even remember because I have these moments when I'm reflective in the morning, but I think that I tweeted that love was like a firefly, that in the night of its beloved's adversity, it shines the brightest. And that's what we must be, and that's what our life might be. And sometimes the adversity of love is within ourselves. But So I'm glad that you have the center here. I'm glad that each of you are here, and because tonight you're leaving some of your soul here. So when somebody comes in that does the kind of work that I do in the world, that you don't know, but you're like a drop in a baptismal pool, collectively allow me to come in and bathe and heal my spirit without your even knowing it. So I thank God for the divine for and everybody for what is taking place in here because we must matter. And I was telling uh, Sister Jenna Chu, in using the Old Testament kind of analogy and ideas that we're like the burning bush. And that even when I'm burdened, Sister Jenna and her giving some exposés of where she was transitioning her life is that even if I don't do anything, even in my most darkest moment, because I believe that my heart is right or because I want my heart to be just right, that I'm a burning bush and that where people are around me should be like a holy ground, that lives should change because they're in our midst, regardless of our outward perception, our outward reality, that even in the darkest moment, we are like a firefly within our own souls, giving our beloved, our own self, light in our own pain. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and now another round of applause for Marcia Dyson. Marcia, uh, th this really is uh, God's gift to the, to the world. Marcia is God's uh, gift to the world. She is probably one of the greatest speakers of all time, but just wanted to say that. There are a few friends in the room that I wanted to invite up, which wasn't really on the program, and I felt like the evening wouldn't be complete. Um, Reverend Sylvie Sumter sent us this beautiful bouquet today, and I have to um, reveal her story to you briefly. Uh, Reverend Sylvia Sumter was on my radio show last year, and we hosted a med America Meditating Retreat. Uh, which we're now making it an annual retreat. And Reverend Sylvie has no time for anyone, <laughs> right? And she's like, I don't even know why I'm going, but I just feel like I need to go to this retreat. And it was from there our relationship really uh, blossomed more. And I feel her a lot uh, in terms of feeling a parallel story. Uh, and so she travels a lot, and she goes to India to find her core, but she's in charge of the Unity Church in Washington, D.C., which is a congregation of over 2,000 members and more. But her heart is incredible. And see, so you have some fans in the room. Yay, Reverend! We're here. And I would like her to come up and share some words with us as she recovered from her... Mm. Well, this was unexpected. Um, actually, as Sister Jenna said, I've, I've been recovering. I just had a bout of shingles, and I had been in the house for about maybe a month and a half now. And I just want to tell you the type of person that Sister Jenna is. Uh, because she, I know that she was busy beautifying this wonderful space for us. 
And uh, when she heard that I was kind of ill, she called me. She said, well, I'll come over to you know, pray with you and to sit with you. And I was sort of like, well, Sister Jenna, I am looking. If, I don't know if you've ever had anything, know anything about shingles. You had, well, I was looking just terrible, you know, because I had it in my hair, and so I wasn't able to do anything with my hair and my neck. And I said, no, you cannot come over. <laughs> and, you know, but uh, I thought to take that time out of, I know that this was a major project, that she would take the time to come and, and to offer to, to sit with me and to pray with me. Um, and that speaks volumes to who Sister Jenna is, you know. It's not about the, life is not about all the outer um, glory or the outer space. It's always about the inner space. And her heart was sort of, well, we can sit and meditate, you know, together. Um, and that was such a wonderful gesture. It really touched my heart. And I have been, I haven't been out in a while because I wasn't able to wear clothing and I'm so delighted that I could put something on my neck and I could wear clothing tonight to be here so this is such a blessing for me and I wanted to be here uh, just to be in the space. See when we come together as spiritual lights and we create a force field that is greater than ourselves individually. So each of us has such a powerful call and a powerful purpose and a powerful presence that when we come together, we create an even greater presence that has the ability to do more even than we think that we can do ourselves. We're part of the collective, you know, and, and, and there's only one body, one mind, one spirit, one heart, one soul, and we are all a part of it, expressing and doing the work in our various ways. I happen to minister at church. You happen to minister in another way. Uh, each of us has our purpose. But as a light bearer, I loved your analogy, because as a light bearer, sometimes the world may challenge your ability to keep your flame burning brightly. But you know, as you go within and touch that inner source, that's what gives you, that's what f flames and gives fuel to your light, to the fire. So remembering always to get centered and to, to be balanced and to touch that which is really untouchable, which is your soul. I, I just did my Easter talk was the first time I was back in church and you know I wasn't quite ready but I felt I wanted to be there and I spoke about the unconquerable soul. Because even though we may get tired out in, in the outer, there is that spirit in us that is unconquerable. That is that, that, that spirit that will, that will give us strength, you know, when we are weary or tired to do the work. Because the divine is going to express. It's just simply our ability to tap into that and to be still enough to recognize the presence. So having a place such as this is a beautiful thing. where We can all come together as one. It's such a, such a delight to look out and see, you know, representation from all over. Because we are doing the work. And we are called from all corners of the world. You know, I happen to go to India because I, I, I feel that there's something there. I go to a particular place that feeds my spirit and my soul and so that I can go and feed others. You know, uh, I always tell my congregation, I must be fed too, you know. Um, and so I go to, to, to uh, replenish the well. And this is such a place where we can all come. Thank you. This is a place where we can come to replenish, to sit to be, to be still, and to know that God is, the divine is with us. So just having, just the fact that we're here to celebrate with you in your expansion. Today I was thinking, you know, the definition that we have for heaven is an expanded state of goodness. You know, it's not a place or whatever, but it's an, a state of expanded goodness. And so this feels like heaven. Your expansion feels like heaven. It's a wonderful place for us to come together and to remember who we are, but most of all, to remember the divine, who the divine is in and through and as us. We are so wonderfully and marvelously made. And uh, what a blessing when we remember that. And what a blessing it is to have a place that we can come to that helps us to remember that we have an unconquerable soul and a wonderful, powerful 
spirit that indwells us with every breath we take. So I'm honored to be here, Sister Jenna, in your presence. And for me, too, it's healing. I just knew I needed to get out, and I was able to put something on comfortably and to be here in this midst, in the consciousness. So um, I'm grateful and thankful for you and the work that you do and the light that you are. Your light just fuels my light and enables me to go on further. So I thank you all, and, you know, we just... Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Uh, isn't it rich, right? One more person, Brother Bhante, from the Wheaton Buddhist um, Fellowship in Silver Spring. I'd like him to come up and do a chant for us, if you don't mind, and then Portia will take over the rest of the evening. Thank you. Very spiritual, very rich, wonderful. Sister Jenna, and we met many times. This wonderful time to come and give the blessing at the, the language called Pali. It is an Indian language, the Buddhist language. I want to give the blessing for the loving kind of sutta, uh, uh, the, like uh, all divine being, uh, all the blessing for the, this place and people who come into the meditation here for everyone to blessing namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhas karaniya mat kusalena yantan santam padang abhisamech sakko juch su juch suvacho chas Mudu anati mani santus kocha subharocha apaki chocha salauka vutti santindriyocha nipakocha apagabbo kulesu ananugiddo nachakuddhan samachare kinchiyen Vinyu pare upavadeyung sukino vake minontu sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta ye kechipan bhutatte tasava thavrava anavasesa dighava ye mahantava majjimarasa Kanuka tola ditta va eva ditta Yecha dure vasanti avidure bhuta vasambhave siva Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta naparo paranniko bete Nati manyet kat chinang kanchi bhyaros na patig sanya Na anya manyas dukkha michaya matayata niyam puttang Ayusayek putt manurakhe evampi sabb bhutesu मान संभव ये अपरिमानम में तंच सब लोकास्मिंग मान संभव ये अपरिमानं उद्धं अधोच तिरियंच असंबादं अवेरं असपत्तं तिट्टं चरनिसिन्नोवा Sayano vayavata savigata middho etan satin Aditteya brahma metan viharang idhamahu Dittincha anupagam silavadas nena sampanno Kame suvineya gedan Nahi jatu gabb seyam punare ti ti e ten Satcha vajjen sab dukkhaṁ vinasatu E ten satcha vajjen sab bhayo vinasatu E ten satcha vajjen 
sab rogo vinasato may you be well happy and peaceful good luck thank you thank you so very very much ladies and gentlemen i just want to uh, say that i'm so thankful that uh, this is being broadcast live worldwide uh, via Skype to capture the marvelous, wonderful words that we've heard uh, thus far. So again, thank you all for your just superb, wonderful uh, comments. Now we're going to uh, have a great time. Uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce a very close dear friend of mine, Chrysaline Petropoulos. Chrysaline is an internationally acclaimed opera singer whose voice took her to Europe, where she sang opera, operetta, and musical theater, and was contracted, contracted with the Vienna State Opera and the Castle State Opera in Germany. Soon she was singing everywhere from Greece, France, and Italy to the Kennedy Center and Lincoln Center in the United States. Chrysaline now teaches how to build confidence to students with different performing goals, ranging in age from 9 to 75. After 12 years of research, she has developed an anatomical scientific system for building endurance for the voice. Chrysaline's lessons are based on her remarkable book entitled Performance Mode and the Ten Technical Commands to Vocal Mastery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our very special celebrity guest, Chrysaline. Wow. Thank you. Everybody needs an agent like Porsche. <laughs> you know, when I was asked to sing this something, what can I sing? What can I do? I don't know. This is not an opera moment. It's very challenging. In fact, trying to, to find what was more challenging than if, I, than if I can? And when I met Sister Jenna, I think you were also, oh, oh, oh. Right? You, you don't need a whole lot of words. <laughs> and she came to our home and, oh. Chrysaline, yeah, Sister Jenna, I'm going to call you Effortless Joy. <laughs> so, yes, I found a song and I hope it's appropriate. It is called For Good. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow if you let them, and we let them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I'm who I am today because I know you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun, like a stream that meets a boulder, Halfway through the wood, who can say if I've been changed for the better, but because I know you, I have been changed for good. And will it be that we will never meet again in this lifetime? So let me say before we part, so much of me tis made of what I learned from you. You'll be with me like a handprint on my heart. And now, whatever way the stories end, 
I know you have rewritten mine by being my friend. Like a ship blown from the mooring by the wind off the sea. Like a sea dropped by a skybird in a distant wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I know you, because I know you, I have been changed for good. Wow. Thank you, Chrysaline. Nice round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. She's fabulous, wonderful. We have rep a representation. Uh, you're going to do the videos now. Okay. All right. We're going to show the videos now. We have um, some videos we'd like to show. Uh, this is uh, just special videos that uh, people from all over the United States uh, have prepared for Sister Jenna and the whole community here. So we're going to watch those now. We'll dim the lights. This is Lexi Potamkin, author and lecturer. Congratulations to the Brahma Kamaris and Sister Jenna for the opening of the Meditation Museum. May everyone who enters this sacred space find inner peace and compassion. And again, congratulations. Hello, my name is William Kellebrew with the William Kellebrew Foundation. And the, found, the William Kellebrew Foundation is focused on ending poverty and violence around the country and around our globe. We focus on trauma, trauma-informed approaches that really focus on uh, supporting families and children and communities. I am here to support the Meditation Museum and say congratulations to a wonderful grand opening today. And as you can see, I'm in the field today in a juvenile center somewhere in the United States, a secure facility here on the ground doing the work. And so thank you, Sister Jenna, and thank you to everyone at Meditation Museum. Congratulations. I'm Warren Adrich. I'm a certified life coach, a mindfulness meditation teacher, blogger for Huffington Post, and author. My book says who will be out this summer. Sister Jenna, I want to congratulate you on your new meditation museum. I know it's going to be a very special place for so many people to pass through and benefit from. I had the good fortune of being on Sister Jenna's radio show, and I can tell you she is really amazing and doing fantastic work on the planet spreading love and meditation throughout the world. Congratulations again, Sister Jenna. I'm so excited to see your new museum. Lots of love and blessings. It takes me over. That's it. Okay. There we have it. Nice round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for those wonderful people sending messages of goodwill for our grand opening. It is my pleasure now, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce uh, from the Office of Constituent Services. Uh, her name is Suzanne Lofhelm, and she is representing Congressman Christopher Van Hollen, Jr. Please let us have a nice round of applause for Suzanne. Good evening, everyone. I am so honored to be here. I have to say I feel very humbled and uh, to be surrounded by such wisdom. And, and I can honestly feel the peace and serenity. Um, and I'm truly grateful to be here and to have this opportunity. So thank you, Sister Jenna. Thank you for inviting Congressman Van Hollen to this event tonight, and, and he is sorry that he couldn't be here, and I'm actually grateful to be here on his behalf so I could experience this. And I'm also a neighbor, so I, I definitely plan to come back and to bring my children, and, and so thank you so much. 
Uh, absolutely, I will. I'm literally just a few moments away. Um, I did want to read the citation that the congressman uh, asked that I present to you on his behalf. Um, the citation is presented to the Meditation Museum in celebration of its grand opening with gratitude and appreciation for its efforts to encourage peace and spiritual change and with best wishes for its success. Signed, Congressman Chris Van Hollen on this day, the 10th of April, 2015. Thank you. Can we just get a photo op, a photo op with the two of you? Okay, great. Don't you just love Portia making me all photo op? <laughs> I don't see any flashes. Okay. <laughs> oh, we have one more photo. Just uh, someone else taking a photo. Just a few more photos. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. We're so honored to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure now. We're going to move on in the agenda, and I'm going to invite up um, some very special people. Uh, this uh, gentleman, his name is Mr. Joseph Young, that is E. Young. He is the constituent liaison uh, from the Legislative District 20 representative, representing Senator Raskin and his three delegates. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Joseph E. Young. I will say good evening, sisters and brothers. I sat here and I felt so moved. I felt as if I was myself. You know, for some of these jobs that we do, we represent people of power. We have also the opportunity to, if I didn't have to come here and represent, I will not have this blessing. I'm living here today with a lot of blessing. I want to encourage everybody to know that this is the place to be, especially with the lives that we live now in this world. We are always moving a little bit faster than what we are supposed to. You know, we juggling jobs and, you know, different lifestyles. Uh, we come from different denominations, but your heart, your mind is only one. You know, your soul is only one. And you are the only one who can find out who you are. And the only way you can find out who you are is by being in a very quiet place and meditate and know who you are. There are a lot of people who don't know who they are. How can you know who somebody is if you don't know who you are? Mm -hmm. So, sisters, I think this is a noble thing, not only for the community, for mankind. Thank you very much for what you are doing. And I will take this opportunity now to read the citation which was sent through me to you by Senator Jamie Raskins and the three delegates, Sheila Hickson, David Boone, and Will Smith. Uh, they are sending it to you, the med 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 Meditation Museum, in recognition of the dedication of services and the humanity and work that you do towards peace and change in the world. And this citation was given from the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, this is in recognition of this work and um, is signed today, the 10th of April, 2015, signed by Sheila Hickson, delegate, David Moon and Will Smith, and I, I will present it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I loved your words. They were very heartfelt. Thank you. Thank you. I had to lasso him to stay. And earlier on, he was like, I have to go, I have to go. So that meant a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Young. We have um, uh, a special guest, Missy uh, Crutchfield from B Magazine, 
and she was a, a very special guest for Sister Jenna on um, America Meditating Radio Show. So, Missy, would you like to come up, please? Ladies and gentlemen, Missy Crestfield. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Quite fortuitous, actually. I wasn't, I wasn't sure I was going to be in D.C. because I live in Tennessee right now. Um, Gandhi's Bee Magazine. That's that's our where we're we're located. Even though we're global, we're Bee Magazine, like one word, like Be the Change .org. But we had uh, we had an invitation to a, a pretty important uh, conference that we've been at all day today at the National Press Club. So important, actually, that mainstream media isn't carrying it, but it's a really all about nonviolence. We work with Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, Arun Gandhi, so let me just share his, his greetings with you because he's become quite fond of Sister Jenna, as have I, as has anyone who's ever heard her voice, experienced her energy, um, been touched by her spirit, and, and that's why this room is packed. And I believe her following and, and, and this work, this blessed work, will continue to grow. And I don't think you're ever going to get to retire, Sister Jenna. She told me, you know I'm going you know, to retire. I said, no, you'll never <laughs> retire. So um, as Arun Gandhi reminds me on a regular basis that I need to calm down, because this is actually calm for me, because when I get fired up, I start talking really fast. And she knows that. Antonio knows that from the, the radio show. I was afraid I wasn't going to be asked back on, because I talk so fast. But Arun reminds me that I need to meditate. He actually shared the, gave me the book, 10% Happier, which is really quite wonderful about meditation and its effects on our health and our focus. And it, it all spills over into being more productive and purposeful in the world. So I experienced that the first time I spoke with Sister Jenna. And there was just this amazing calmness over me. And I said, I have to do this. I have to learn more about it. So I did read the book, and I told Arun, thank you. And I said, you really have to do the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> he was in the airport when that was going on. And I said, Sister Jenna says you have to do the ice bucket challenge. And he says, do you think I'm crazy? There's people all around. And, and I said, no, that would be wonderful. So we're going to have to get him to do it. But um, the, the OM challenge, excuse me, that was inspired by the ice bucket challenge. OK, yes, of course, the OM. The OM challenge. Um, Nonviolence work is, is not passive. Gandhi's message reminds us of that. When we're working for peace, it is active in our life. It is moving. It is high energy. And sometimes it can be very stressful. Because the more you're aware of all of the things happening in the world and, and the deeper connection with our purpose and all the things that compassion does and it pulls you and pulls you, you have to find a release. You have to find some kind of a, of a break. And meditation, that's where it comes and it heals and protects us. And I learned that more and more. And it's a work in, in progress. And, and, and my life is, and I imagine all of ours are. So as I continue to move in this world, and tomorrow we'll be presenting at the Gandhi King Conference in Memphis. So I, I happened to be here, and this was the opening for this. So I, I think all things kind of in a namaste sort of way happen. And I'm, I'm so blessed to be here. And you are even so much more beautiful in person. <laughs> I, I, you know. It's and, <laughs> And Antonio, thank you. So thank you for indulging me, allowing me to share a message of peace from Arun Gandhi, grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. We hope that you will look at some of the work we're doing at Gandhi's Bee Magazine and our newly formed Gandhi Global Center for Peace. I will think about you in this event and, and connections ongoing with Sister Jenna. Blessings. Namaste. Thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I tell you, the power in this room, the guests, uh, this, is, uh, this was meant to be. It, it is just uh, incredible. I just want to have a, a shout out. I was given a note from Antonia that we do have other guests uh, from America Meditating that were on Sister Jenna's America Meditating radio show. Margaret Placenta Johnson, Molly uh, Papadi, and, and Marty P P uh, Panina. Are they here? There they are. Thank you. Could you stand, please? These are all um, very special, gifted people. Uh, if you listen to American, uh, America Meditating Radio Show, 
and I listen to it, uh, I try to every, every morning. It's quite amazing. So we thank you for coming. Your presence is most welcome, and uh, thank you for being in this beautiful space with these ma magnificent people. So we thank you all. Um, going to move al along in the program, and uh, we'll, uh, we, I'd like to read a citation right now. This is a citation that, because we, we've changed a, a few things in the program. I'm going to read a citation from Senator Barbara Mikulski. And uh, it's a certificate. It's uh, presented to Sister Jenna on behalf of the grand opening of the new Meditation Museum. And in recognition of your commitment to serving humanity and working for positive change by providing workshops to the Silver Spring community that helps with life skills, leadership, finances, and personal development. Best wishes for your future success, Barbara Milkowski, United States Senator, on this day, the 10th of April, 2015. I'd also, at this moment, like to read a proclamation from the governor's office. This is the governor of Maryland, ladies and gentlemen. Governor of the state of Maryland to the Meditation Museum, greetings. Be it known that on behalf of the citizens of this state, in recognition of the occasion of the grand opening celebration of the newly established Meditation Museum in Silver Spring, with sincere congratulations and best wishes to the friends and supporters of this nonprofit organization, and as the people of Maryland join together in commending the success of the museum's commitment to serve humanity and to work for positive change, we are pleased to confer upon you this governor's citation given on the day, April the 10th. Sign, Governor Lawrence Hogan, Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, this is amazing. Wonderful, wonderful uh, presentations, and thank you for those, uh, you know, having these certificates. It's just uh, wonderful. Now I'm going to introduce uh, our, yes, this is, uh, you're in for an amazing treat. I'm a huge fan of this next performer. She is beyond incredible. <laughs> she is phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, please, uh, I'm introducing Vijay uh, Nathan. Vijay is one of the leading Indian American female comedians, making people laugh across America and internationally, too. International comedy phenomenon, P Russell Peters calls her one of the top two South Asian comics in the world to watch. She has performed in South Africa, England, and Canada, and was featured at the Montreal International Comedy Fest Festival Just for Laughs and the Smirnoff International Comedy Festival. Washington, D.C. loves her, too, and she's performed at the Smithsonian Museum, Kennedy Center, Constitution Hall, Library of Congress, and won the award for artistic ex excellence from the Shakespeare, from the Speakeasy, D.C. She's gained attention from critics, from her solo shows, Women on Top, Tips from Mom and Dad and Cosmo, and good girls don't, but Indian girls do. <laughs> VJ grew up as a foreigner, or at least that's what uh, at least that's what everyone called her in the suburbs suburbs of Washington D.C., where she was born. Her material comes from her experience as an Indian girl in America, raising two immigrant parents, dating boys with mothers who wish their sons could find a nice blonde girl named Tiffany and the universal quest for love, understanding, and a pair of undies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and only V.J. Nathan. Okay, okay, wonderful. Okay, don't stop applauding just because I haven't right. said anything. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Jenna, for asking me to be here. I am incredibly humbled to be in the presence of such uh, amazing people here tonight, and such amazing speakers, and all of you. Um, I feel like such wonderful energy in this room right now. So, so thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm a little scared to perform now. <laughs> No, no, no. I won't be inappropriate like you kind of thought I was last time. So I will keep it clean. No, no, I'm going to keep it clean. I'll keep it clean. Um, so, yeah. So, um, and I'm glad that you gave us all this beautiful blue booty look for the evening. So all of us. 
can, you know, look beautiful together. Um, but so, but one of the things I, and this is before I actually start, um, my grandfather was a Gandhian poet. And he is the poet laureate of Tamil Nadu, the state in India where my family is from. And, um, and he wrote the, the Salt March song that they would sing on the way to go to the sea, go to do the Salt March. And so all of his writing was about, um, you know, non-violently fighting uh, the oppression of the British. And so when I started doing um, comedy and performing, um, I was thinking, okay, part of the reason I am doing what I do is because I wanted to show that, um, that because of the kind of the racism I experienced and the intolerance um, that I experienced, I wanted to show that um, I was like anybody else. And so in that way, I kind of feel very connected to my grandfather, whereas he used his words to, to fight off oppression and I'm using it to fight intolerance in, a, in another way. So, so I'm glad to be here tonight. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, and I very much, there are phenomenal speakers here tonight, which I'm, I, I wish I could be like them and do the amazing work that they are doing, but I do relate to this idea of, um, of, me, of being in your presence and feeling, f getting filled up. And, and, and I'm so glad that I'm here and I'm so glad that I get to do this for you. So um, how many people here have parents that were born in another country? By a round of applause. Yes, okay, there, there are a lot of you. There are a lot of you here. Um, so um, my father was born in India, and um, he had a very particular way of looking at his three daughters. I'm the youngest of three girls, but my father had a very unique way of seeing his girls. Shanti, you are brilliant. You are the Albert Einstein of the family. <laughs> Absolutely smart, just like me. But socially, you are a moron. <sighs> I guess not every genius can have charm. <laughs> Indu, you're the kindest, sweetest, most big-hearted girl, but totally inept. I couldn't trust you to boil an egg. And Vijay, my pretty baby, with the most beautiful black hair, so long and pretty, but totally dumb. <sighs> Well, you'll never be a brain surgeon, but maybe one day you will marry one. My sisters and I were like Charlie's angels with really low self-esteem. <laughs> so I took my hair very, very seriously. My, we were, the three of us were forbidden from cutting our hair. My mom was very clear about it. She said, Indian men only want three things from wife. One, long, properly braided hair. Two, good curry. Three, I'll tell you after you get married. <laughs> And my father simply said, if you cut your hair, I'll kill you. <laughs> so I took my hair seriously because I had the best hair in my entire family. Um, some might say I had the best hair of all the Indians in Maryland. <laughs> Let's be serious. I had the best hair of all the Indians in the world. One day, um, we took a trip to South India to a temple called Tirupadi, and, um, and it's up the side of a mountain. And during this long, winding car ride up the side of the mountain, when I was about five years old, my sister Indu kept looking at my two long, long braids and saying, gosh, Vijay, your hair is so beautiful. I'm really going to miss it. I had no idea what she was talking about until we pulled up to those temple gates and out of those gates flooding out, I saw hundreds of bald men, women, and children. Now apparently every th true Hindu comes to this temple at least once in his or her life, shaving his head in honor of Lord Vishnu, stripping himself of all vanity and pride in front of God. Now my sisters had been born in India, so they had their heads shaved before they came to America. Now, I was born here, and no sharp object had ever come near this. As soon as I realized what the plan was, I did what any rational five-year-old do, would do. I screamed, and I locked myself in the car. My mom was begging me to come out on one side, and my sister Indu was on the other side doing cutting motions with her fingers. <laughs> 
Finally, my mother lured me out with a bowl of mango ice cream and simply, yes, and simply picked one strand of hair from my head and said, your hair is too beautiful and would serve Vishnu much better if it stayed right on your head. So I thought my hair was a blessing, divine in fact, until the third grade. That was when I was the new girl in my elementary school, and that was when I met Jill Green, the meanest girl in third grade. Now, she um, had, and richest, she um, had, the, her first day of school outfit was a pink uh, Ralph Lauren polo, Calvin Klein jeans, matching pink Keds, and she wore Bonnie Bell lip gloss. I mean, she looked like she had just stepped off the cover of Seventeen magazine. My first day of school outfit was a yellow uh, baby doll dress with Winnie the Pooh on the lapels. After school that first day, Jill and her crew rolled up on me, and she said, gosh, Vijay, what are you? Oh, well, I'm Indian. Oh, is that like an Apache? <sighs> Can you do a rain dance? I mean, actually, I'm not that kind of Indian, and I'm a really bad dancer, and I know that, dummy. By the way, nice long braids, Pocahontas. I bet your hair falls in the toilet when you poop. And from that moment on, my new elementary school nickname was Pocahontas Poophead. And this was the first time that I realized that maybe my hair was not such a blessing after all. And I started to notice the other girls with, with their short bangs and, and, and glamorous haircuts and feathered hair. And I wanted to be less Indian and more like them. And any time I would complain, my mother wouldn't hear of it. And my father would just say, Vijay, your hair is beautiful. They don't know. They're just Americans. <laughs> Well, that advice never cheered me up. The, the, the thing that always cheered me up was getting to plan my birthday party. So for my 12th birthday party, um, I got to buy a brand new outfit. And, um, and we were, so I got this amazing glittery purple dress with the word pizzas on the front of it because we were going to Chuck E. Cheese and we'd be eating some pizza. It was pretty exciting. When I came home and I modeled it for my sister Indu, she said, dummy, it says pizzazz. <laughs> the other reason I loved my birthday was it was because it was the one day of the year that I wasn't forced by my mother to wear these two nerdy Indian braids. So, hold on a second. I got to wear my hair out, long and flowing. My hair was so long, well past my tush. And I was a preteen Indian goddess. I knew that I looked hot. I sauntered in to Chuck E. Cheese. I had invited all the popular girls from my school except for Jill. I knew they weren't my friends, but they would add a certain cachet to the event. I ate some pizza, played a little Miss Pac-Man, shot some skeet ball, and then I zoned in on this kitty ride. It was a baby Ferris wheel, for one. All it was was a seat that would rotate up and down. That is all it did. But I couldn't resist the pull of this wheel. So I put my token in, and I squeezed my butt into that child seat. And when the ride went up, I could survey all of Chuck E. Cheese, and it was so peaceful, and then it would come down again, and my feet would hit the floor. But then when it came up, I could hear the buzz of arcade games, people laughing, the smell of cheese pizza, and it was so peaceful. And suddenly, I felt a tug on my hair, but then it passed. But then I started to notice it again, growing stronger, and I realized that my hair was getting sucked into the center of the wheel. I tried to get myself out, but it only seemed to make it worse. Finally, I screamed, hey, somebody help! And a kid who had been playing a video came over and he pulled the plug. So now I was trapped like a rat in this ride. And at this point, if you can believe it or not, Chuck E. Cheese was completely silent. 
every, my, my birthday party had surrounded me, every birthday party had surrounded me, and it was completely quiet except for my mother. <laughs> And my father came up, and he, um, he's an engineer, and so he inspected the gears and the mechanisms. And he finally said, I think if we turn her head the other way around, <laughs> her head will just pop right out. <sighs> and I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Dad, please just, just get me out. So he took a pair of scissors, and he cut me free. So now half of my hair is cut in rough chunks around my shoulders, and the other half is still well past my butt. And I realize I am being punished. I should have braided my hair like my mom always wanted me to. I should have shaved my head for Vishnu all those years ago. <laughs> and then this wouldn't have happened to me. The next day, uh, we went to a place that no one in my family had ever been to before, the hair cuttery. <laughs> my fate was left in the hands of our stylist, Jesus. Um, he was the first Hispanic man that we had ever met. And while he was surveying the damage done to my hair, my mom comes up to him and says, Excuse me, um, Jesus. Um, <laughs> could you try to preserve the length of her hair? And I'm thinking, how is he going to do that? Half of my hair is gone. But believe it or not, Jesus performed a miracle. <laughs> and in the front, he gave me bangs and feathers. And in the back, he left a long, velvety highway of hair. And through Jesus, I was born again. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Sister, Sister Jenna has, has made a special request. Like I'm, like I'm a singer, and you're just like, here, do that one. Okay. Okay. I, th I think I know which one you're talking about. Okay. Okay. So, so okay. So um, this is based on her request. So uh, so I, I and Sister Jenna, we love to see <laughs> white people at Indian weddings, because when they come, they're like, oh my god, what an amazing cultural experience. The colors are all so beautiful. Then three hours later, they're like, when is this going to end? <laughs> Please, when? So, OK, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that was great. VJ, another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for VJ Nathan. I, I agree with those critics. Uh, you're going to be uh, the talk of everyone's home. I, absolutely phenomenal. One of my favorites that you do is the Lucille Ball. Uh, it's the, one of the funniest acts I've ever seen. I was telling Crystal, it's absolutely wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause, and we're going to bring on our next speaker. Is this on? Yes, it is. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, it is my honor to introduce Minister N.K. Mishra, Minister of Personnel and Community Affairs with the Embassy of India to speak. Please welcome Minister N.K. Mishra. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be in this hall filled with peace and happiness. And I hope all of you must be feeling the same. This Brahma Kumari Meditation Museum, which is being inaugurated today, is an addition to the endless endeavors this organization has been doing across the globe towards the betterment of the mankind. Meditation, as has been spoken by various speakers here, and has been felt by many of us, is a means by which individuals understand their inner strength, values, and well-being, not only towards one's own peace, but the peace and prosperity 
of the mankind. I would like to say uh, here the importance of medita meditation, which is called dhyan in Hindi or Sanskrit, according to the Hindi math Hindu mythology, from Patanjali Ashtang Yoga. And Patanjali Ashtang Yoga means the yoga which has the eight divisions, yam, niyam, asan, pranayam, dharan, dhyan, and samadhi. I am not going to explain all these eight, but this dhyan is just before samadhi. Samadhi is the ultimate objective which a yogi tries to attend, and dhyan is that. Dhyan is just before that. So this is the seventh step towards samadhi, which a yogi tries to attain. This is the importance in Hindu mythology. And if one realizes by himself, and if you meditate, do dhyan, you identify with yourself, which is a tremendous strength, as has been uh, spoken by previous uh, speakers. Regarding the programs and initiatives taken by Brahma Kumari organization, it's wonderful across all over the globe. And I would like to especially highlight the empowerment of women through these initiatives. Because empowerment of women is a real, real thing which can do a lot of good to the humanity and man mankind. And again, I would like to quote from Hindu mythology where this empowerment has been emphasized. It says, Ki nariyastu yatra pujyante ramante tatra devata. Wherever women is empowered, women are revered, God lives there. So this is the importance. And I think Brahma Kumari deserves an applause for that. On this occasion, I on my behalf, on behalf of Embassy of India, congratulate Brahma Kumari to have this wonderful place for the well-being, peace and prosperity of mankind. And I also thank Sister Jaina for inviting and honoring me to be here. Thank you once again. Thank you, Minister. We're very honored to have you here this evening. Now, uh, before we're, we're coming very close to the end of the program, but um, I'm really privileged to introduce this new CD produced by Sister Jenna called Off the Grid. Basically, it's uh, really groundbreaking. It's a guided meditation for people on the move. It's exper experiential, powerful, motivating, and heart-centered. For the first time, you can listen to a guided meditation while on the move or just sitting to find your own inner space. In times of great stress, Off the Grid will help you regain power, peace, and motivation. Let's listen. I invite you to become aware of the two types of consciousness that reside within the soul. Let us choose the consciousness of light over the darkness of past stories, the history that gets into our way. Let us now remember our connection to the supreme energy, the supreme soul, the being of light. For far too long, we have allowed the external forces to dictate our inner force. And at this time, I choose to get off the grid and step inside the heart to be myself. I choose to no longer be under the influence of what the world tells me, what my parents have told me, spouse, friends, or anyone who has been a negative influence in my life. In this meditation, I stand strong in the original, eternal, imperishable worth of the soul. I, the being of light, the soul of power. I 
step into the heart and I become a being of love, a being of light and goodness. Very beautiful. I mean, it real, let's have a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. We have a, another song. Um, this is, uh, it's called Road of Gold by Bliss. Uh, if we're available to play that now, we'd like to hear a very sh a short song, Road of Bliss, while we're in the moment.
turning into diamonds and every road you tread is a road that's paved with gold every road you tread is a road that's paved with gold Beautiful. Beautiful. We have uh, just a few uh, other short vignette videos from uh, guests on the America Meditating Radio Show that it, we'd like to show right now. So we're going to dim the lights. Just a few more people. This is the Reverend Canon Charles Gibbs, founding executive director emeritus of the United Religions Initiative and longtime fellow traveler with the Brahma Kumaris community around the world. It is a privilege and an honor to take this opportunity to send my congratulations and wishes for every success to Sister Jenna and the Brahma Kumari Center in the greater Washington, D.C. area. As you launch this new meditation museum, I wish you every success, not only in the launch, but in the programming I know will flow forth from this day. Our nation's capital, our nation, and the whole world are in such turmoil and selfishness, uh, division, greed, uh, it so often seem to hold sway. I know the programming you will offer will bring great light into the midst of this growing darkness and help lead us to the day when in fact light, love, healing, and joy will prevail on this earth. So while I am not able to be with you in person, I wish you again every blessing, every joy, and look forward to many future programs in this museum. Hi, I'm Valerie Alexander, author, speaker, filmmaker, and coach. I am so happy that the Meditation Museum is expanding and celebrating its grand opening, and so excited about the launch of the Google Hangout, Listen, Emerge, Become, where once a month, thought leaders from around the world share their expertise in the areas of finance, health, relationships, spirituality, women, and my own personal areas of research, speaking, and coaching happiness and success. My message for everyone visiting, watching, and sharing this event is that true happiness is within you and it's easier to achieve than you might think. Start every day by taking three deep cleansing breaths. Breathe in and out and say, I'm a happy person. It doesn't have to be true when you say it, but saying it makes it more true. Then, end every day by reminding yourself of five things that made you happy that day. You can do it. And when you do this every day, it will raise your happiness baseline and put you on a path to lasting, permanent happiness. It has been a true blessing to have been part of the American Meditating Radio Show and getting to know Sister Jenna. And today, I share your joy as this journey continues. Pepper, no Mark! No! Sorry! I want you on camera. I have a puppy here. Dog. Dog. Om Shanti. I'm Diane Collins, and I am the creator of the Quantum Think System of Thinking and the author of Do You Quantum Think? New Thinking That Will Rock Your World. And I have had the honor and privilege of meeting Sister Jenna and of being a guest on her America Meditating radio show. And I am so thrilled and honored to congratulate Sister Jenna and all the Brahma Kumari community on the grand opening of the new and improved <laughs> Meditation Museum. 
And I know that it is going to bring so much growth and development and happiness and peace to so many people who will be enjoying the program. Hey everyone, I'm Nina Boski from Life Bites Entertainment and I'm so excited to share the wonderful news of the expansion of the Meditation Museum. Sister Jenna Antonio and everybody there celebrating, I just hold this moment for you that you will get a chance to experience all the love and all the joy you give to everybody each and every day. Experience that a thousand fold with this wonderful new expansion. Congratulations. Mwah. A memory deep down in my soul And safe from harm Wonderful messages, wonderful messages. Before I bring Sister Jenna up uh, for the closing, we have one last video uh, from Sister Mahuni, who is the founder, uh, well, the director of uh, Brahma Kamaras for All the Americas. So let's show that video. Love and peace. Congratulations and good wishes. Welcome to the inauguration of such a unique place. I think it's of its own kind in the world with the name of Meditation Museum. If we say Meditation Museum, it very clearly indicates that it will depict, it will show, there will be displays. Displays will also show the simple methods, importance, and the benefits of the meditation. I think that in today's world, word meditation is very popular. Everyone loves it. And it's not that everyone have uh, practice, uh, everyone is practicing, but definitely many of you must have tried Meditation is something very, very simple. As simple as learning what to think and how to think. We think and we think all the time, all 24 hours, consciously, in subconscious mind, in form of dreams, but there is always expression of mind. But to experience that discipline or direction of the mind and to be master of my own mind, it is important to learn then how do I think. When I say how is that sometimes the thoughts are very fast. They are very, very many in number like something you could have 10 thoughts, either it's for the task, it's for relationship or the self, but we might have 100. And by the time that thought changes into words and into actions, they might be very few. I know that there are some people, they think a lot and then they talk a lot. So once I was mentioning to someone that what why you talk so much this person said because what i think i have to talk so that means thinking then talking then attitude then vision then interaction so there is no what we call as a proper positive and constructive way to conduct one's own life because the expression of life is in the form of thoughts, words, actions, attitude, vision, and that's what creates the world around us all the time. And today we need that very much in the world 
to stay very positive, to stay very peaceful and every expression of life of non-violence because there is so much violence in the world, not physical but verbal, mental, through negative vibrations but all that is considered to be part of violence but to have peace and non-violence or non-violence is what also creates peace. So meditation, knowledge of meditation, the technique of meditation actually helps to create such a lifestyle, such different ways of self-expression and that is actually called life where every thought as I said which creates vibrations, every word which creates some kind of atmosphere I think that that change happens through meditation. Once I understand what life is, what is the expression of the life and how do I direct them towards not only thinking but very positive, creative and constructive task. Because there are three things in life, self, relationships and the task. All three are important, so we cannot start with relationships or tasks, but we have to start with the self. Whatever is the thinking, belief and the image of the self and the self-respect. I think based on that will be our relationship with others which should be very loving, very friendly, very friendly and also where we can learn from each other, forgive and forget also. So all the good qualities which are required to sustain a good relationship actually comes from our self-transformation. Efficiency, concentration, focus, achievement and the results of the task also depends on the self. I have noticed people, they are doing something and their mind is for some doing another thing. So when they are doing, you can see their quality is not good. Simple action like washing pots, but they are thinking of computer. While on computer, they are thinking of giving talk. So their mind is not with the action. They always think of next. Oh, I have to do this stress. And that because of that, the result and the improvement and the progress which we want to experience is not very visible. So I think learning meditation is very very important for those who are not very busy or those who are very busy. Especially those who are very busy and have some important um, jobs to do, responsibility, they need meditation more because the quality of life quality of performance, quality of relationship changes because it's something very real, something very practical. And of course in meditation, because one connects with one's own self, true self, and also connect with the source, one who is almighty, one who is unlimited, and one who is our protector, and one who gives us power. So connecting with the source also is something which is very, very necessary at this time. Because then self doesn't have enough strength, doesn't have enough insights. Then you go above everything, you connect with one who is above. And then from there, that divine power, that spirituality and experience of inner strength happens. So I want to wish you all the team who has put it together. I want to wish the center of Washington DC, those who are the sponsors of this museum. I want to wish you all those who have come very, very many greetings and also lots of lots of love for yourself and peace for the world. Om Shanti. Thank you.
That was amazing, beautiful, again, more, more beautiful uh, sentiments, words. I'd like now to bring Sister Jenna up for our final closing comments. Wow, what a night, huh? Do you feel complete? And this is just a touch, just a little bit, right? Um, Hannah, hi. Hannah from Congressman Rangel's office. Um, what do I say after this evening? Um, well, let me start with Sister Mahini's message. Uh, Sister Mahini and I first met when I was in Jamaica dating the son of the Prime Minister. And there was a hurricane in Miami. And at that time, I was living in the condominium overlooking the Atlantic. And the center had lost its light and water. And so my mother called and said, Jen, could the center stay at your apartment while you're away? And I said, sure. And if you've ever been to a Brahma Kumari center, everything is white and peaceful and pure and beautiful. And at my condo, it was Italian black and red. It was my coloring at the time. So when Sister Mahini actually went to my place, she's like, scenes have changed. You know, the drama has changed. And I first met her in the ethers of thought. So I was in Jamaica, and I could feel her good wishes touching the soul. And I remembered responding to her and saying, you can stay as long as you want, don't worry, I'm not coming back until a month's time. And I wasn't even aware of the soul-to-soul -soul connection that we had. And so whilst in Jamaica, I had um, quite a number of visions of God's light. And at that time, I'm young. I'm 21, 22, I'm fine. I'm not interested in God or anything, I'm living. And um, the energy of this light just entered my consciousness, offered a download. And for some reason, everything that I had didn't seem as important as the experience of God's light. It just wasn't that important. Um, dating the son of a prime minister of a country and staying over the house and knowing that I would find some way to be a woman so we could get married, all of that wasn't important anymore. It was the experience of God's light that was important. So um, Sister Mahini was my teacher, and uh, I have learned a lot from her. I've learned a lot of wisdom from her um, stability and her power of silence. But I think what I've learned the most from her is her commitment. When you're committed to truth, truth never changes, but truth will change you. And I've learned that. I've learned that. So it's been 17 years in Washington, and since I've been sent here on assignment, it was supposed to be for three to six months. And I stand here in front of you, not here because I am my own island, as Marcia had mentioned earlier in her eloquent sharing tonight, but because of incredible members of this community. And I'd like to call them to come up front. They're very, very shy, and they're going to embarrass me. And even though it, it's going to seem like my voice doesn't count, I would really like them to come up if it's possible. Deepak, Dharmistra, um, Sister Gita, Antonia, Julio, Evelyn, David, Suja, Santosh, Thomas on the camera, Rashmi, Meena, Bubbly. See, n none of them come up. See what I'm saying? <laughs> That's just the hardest group. <laughs> And for the brave one who stood up on behalf of all of them is Brother Deepak, who I had the fortune of sitting with him at the old museum, sharing with him about life. 
and he was going through a rough spill at the time. And since then, his wife and himself have really moved forward spiritually. They now offer courses at their home in Bel Air, Maryland, which is over an hour away from here. And on Sundays, you can see them at the Meditation Museum and the Meditation Oasis in McLean, Virginia. And it was around breakfast that Deepak sat with me one Sunday, and I said, Deepak, I'm going to have to move. Uh, now I have to find a place. Uh, and he goes, don't worry. I'll send you the construction people. And I'd forgotten that he even said that, because the m most important thing on my mind is to find a venue. But after I found it, I remembered Deepak's words, don't worry. I'll send the guys for you. The guys will do it for you. He was in the midst of construction for his um, wholesale place in, in Maryland. And he loaned me his guys in the midst of his assignment that he had to go through inspection. And he sent them anyway because he knew I didn't want to pay an extra rent. And he sent these guys and they put this place together. And um, the owner, Mr. Haddad, is here in the back. Mikey, are you here? Dr. Haddad, please. And um, when I came in and I met Dr. Haddad, it was on Friday the 13th. That's an auspicious day. <laughs> and I asked the community to come on February the 14th, which is a Saturday if we want, if you like the space. And Dr. Haddad and I met. And this is Mr. Michael Haddad. <laughs> and he kind of looked a little bit nervous when I was talking to him, and a little bit like sweaty. I know he doesn't remember. He still is. And I just thought, I says, are you okay? He just says, I just feel like I've been in a little trance since I've been just talking with you. And I thought, this is the place, and this is my brother. And that's how we're here. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're coming to the close of the opening. But the big work is the sustaining. You know, anyone can create a great idea and do a great program. But it's what you do afterwards that matters the most. And it's what you do with your good thoughts or your good words afterwards. Um, to not just be someone that has a lot of words but no content. To not be somebody who just has a lot of ideas but they're just staying on the shelf. But to be able to bring them into fruition um, and go against everything that you might not even be aware you have in you. And to be able to connect to God's love and God's light and to make it happen no matter what. And you keep smiling and you keep your happiness along the way. I think that's what we need to do more of. So I'd like to thank everyone who has participated tonight. And before I close, I would just like to throw, you know, offer the mic to you, not throw the mic at you, <laughs> but open the mic to you. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to share briefly that touched you, that moved you, that brought you into a place of realization, we'd be happy to pass the mic around. Evelyn? And don't be shy. I know a lot of people don't believe I used to stutter, and I used to walk with my head down kicking cans. And I used to be that shy. changes. So please, anyone would like to share an experience or a realization tonight? Don't be shy. Ah. Don't let me choose you. <laughs> Thank you. It's on. It's on. Um, it resonated with me. Sister Mahini the last yes. person on the video, um, that it meditation is very real and practical. Um, I think that says it all right there. And when we connect with ourselves as well as with God, that's uh, a wonderful experience. Thank you.
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I've got the mic on this side. Princess over there? In the back? In the back, somebody in the back. Hi, this is Marty Pineda, and I just wanted to thank you for your vision and for your incredible heart and just generosity and tirelessness because of you. There's amazing things that have happened in the world, and, um, and I just feel really blessed you know, to be here. I feel so filled. It was a very um, difficult day for me today, and being here and the energy of all this love and healing really made a difference for me, so thank you so much. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I would just like to say I'm happy to be here. I started going to the Meditation Museum when it was on Georgia Avenue with my best friend, and ever since then, when we walked in, it just always felt abundance of love. Um, Sister Gita and Sister Jenna, you always just had that smile on your face that even though when we had bad days, when we walked into your presence, we were always happy. Um, I now practice meditation daily because of the Meditation Museum. Um, so I just want to say thank you for opening up a larger space now that I can invite more people. And I'm just <laughs> happy that everyone's here and that you're able to touch everyone in the building. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Sister Gita here? Could we get Sister Gita out for a minute? And are there any more comments? Come on, one or two more. <laughs> We're OK. <laughs> Just happy to be in our expanded space. And um, I'm Papaya. And uh, last week, I got one of those mysterious calls that comes from Sister Gita who says, oh, Papaya, I expect to see you on Friday. <laughs> so I'm happy to be here. Um, when I got here, she asked me, did I bring the harp? I didn't bring the harp, but I look forward to playing it in this space and, and uh, joining with the vibration that's already here. And since we're so close to the highway, I just know we're going places. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I just know we're going places, and since there's such a full room of people, I know that already we That's need an, okay. an, an expanded space, so we just keep growing. Thank so thank you. you for inviting me, and it's wonderful to be here. Om Shanti. Thank you, Papaya. I'd like to introduce you all to Sister Gita. She's the mother of the place. I, I feel like I know all of you. And they call me the mother, but I'm also the joker. <laughs> And I honestly feel I know all of you. So did you enjoy yourselves? Yes. Uh -huh. So this is a spiritual university. It's also a spiritual hospital. Because all of us are diseased with five vices, which covers our original qualities of purity, peace, love, bliss, and truth. And those five vices, do you remember what they are? When I first came and took the course, I thought, I have that one, this one, this one, but I don't have this one. And it was the one that I had second, the, that was number two <laughs> with me. So sister calls it algae, anger, lust, greed, attachment, and ego. It causes all our sorrow. No one is your enemy. It's these things that creates all my sorrow creates things with my body, creates things with relationships, no? And my pocketbook, these five things. So you can get rid of them. Hmm? It will take some time. Hmm? So walk with faith and patience, yeah? And you will gradually drop them. Don't hurry it up. Hmm? All right, so my life before I came here, Oh my goodness, don't even ask. <laughs> Antonio, please, don't go there. Because <laughs> she often says to me, Gita, now, which entertainer you didn't date? That's something. 
And when I came to this course, I realized what had caused my greatest sorrow. And I said, OK, God, here's the key. Take it. Give it back to me after 25 X amount of years. And my life has been, hasn't been going through this hill and gully ride, or roller coaster ride since then. I no longer have to pay $600 to get my hair done. See, I have no hair, but I feel beautiful because I'm not my hair. I'm not my age, I'm not my body, I'm much more. Hmm? So thank you. When you have that feeling or that experience, be it two, three, four, five, six, seven times, you'll never forget it, that you're this, your energy, and you're just like your supreme parent, honestly. And you will spend the rest of your life to recall that experience. Oh, God. Thank you. You're, if you were up here looking at you, my God, you would love yourselves even more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Om Shanti. <laughs> She is also an exquisite dancer. We were at our retreat center in Peace Village in the Catskills, and it was New Year's night. And Sister Geet is Jamaican. That's my Jamaican side. And do you know limbo in Jamaica? So they go limbo like that, then limbo. And she went down. And then everyone goes, Sister Jenna, don't you have the jeans? I go, no. <laughs> I have none of those jeans. <laughs> Anyway, so thank you all so much. I would really love to get David and the crew up. David, are you there? I don't know if you all know Brother David, but Brother David and Julio worked tirelessly at getting the exhibit of the cycle of time up and the tree of religions and the Who Am I exhibit and the power to judge. And if it really wasn't for Brother David and Brother Julio's love and being up until 1 o'clock in the morning to make sure the place was ready before you get here, uh, it would have been half haphazard. We would have been an interesting scene, but we would have enjoyed ourselves anyway because we're meditators, so we're not supposed to be like professional, right? No, we're supposed to be. So anyway, I really want to give a big um, round of applause to Brother David. Brother Julio, um, I want to also mention, well, I don't have to keep mentioning Antonia because we're working all together, but we work really tirelessly to do a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, there's someone who's not here, and that's Sister Nancy. There's just something about her. When she touches something, it just looks beautiful like this podium. <laughs> that if you were to see it, it's just amazing. And um, Evelyn, everybody, Megan, Suja, I don't know if Suja's here, Sister Bubbly, who made sure the food was ready, Dharmistra, who made sure she prepared very nice treats for you. There's so many of us behind the scenes here. I'd like to mention Dada, who has been a big supporter of ours for so long. Could you just stand up, Dada? Dada drives on his own, and I think today he got driven, though. I won't tell you how many bouts of this that he has had broken, and he goes, I'm not stopping yet. And he just keeps going. So my final message to each and every one of you tonight, um, if you ever doubt yourself, consider it to be hell. We're not here to doubt ourselves for one bit. We will go through challenges. That's what life's about at this time. And those challenges are giving us a chance to see how strong we really are on the inside. Your relationships will break, and sometimes they won't give you a date. It'll just happen all of a sudden. And when it does, it'll have you go deep within yourself to find out where your friends are within you, which is love, peace, purity, truth, and joy. They are your best friends. And if you use them more and more, nothing outside of you can shake you, break you, or destroy you. And if you choose to turn your back on your five friends, then you will adopt five other friends, anger, lust, greed, 
attachment and ego. And they will have a way to support your limitations and your self-doubt. They will even create a group or a company or an orchestra to, to validate your belief systems. I believe that love is something that you keep leaning into. Whether it's working or not, you don't turn your back on it. I know therapists and people will tell you, don't talk to them, don't turn this way, don't look at them, don't even speak about them. I don't understand what that means. Because love never stops. You know? So you keep, just lean into it so that you can break through whatever that limit is. And if you keep allowing that limit to breathe through you, you're going further away from God. But if you lean into the limit, then you're saying, I am walking with God. And God's got my back and my forward and my side and my top and my bottom. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us and all the delegates and the friends and the fans and the first timers and the ones who will not be first timers for coming out tonight. And we are going to start a new initiative entitled Listen, Emerge, Become, where a lot of our guests from the America Meditating Radio Show will join you here in the community on Google Hangout offering you their gifts of their wisdom. And so that'll be once a month. So please, you have a calendar of events, so please stay tuned with some of those things. And I'd like to close us off with a meditation. Is that okay? And we have a little treat that we would like to give to you. Uh, it's called Toli, and Toli is a sweet. So whenever you eat it, you have to be sweet. <laughs> and we also have a blessing card that we would like you to take with you and create those beautiful vibrations. So just for a little while, I'd like you to breathe in and out deeply. And as Sister Mahini said, not to think too far ahead. Don't be worried about the things you just can't change. Just be present in the meditation space. Breathe in and out. Become aware of the sounds around you. There's no need to rush. The space that you are sitting in is safe. It's sacred. And you have contributed to the atmosphere tonight. Each and every one of you. You brought into this space a gift into the room. Something that many will treasure for a very long time. So let's let down all of our guards and limits and titles and roles and positions and just be ourselves. Let go of your name. Let go of your gender. Don't consider yourself a man or a woman tonight. Just let it go. It's not important. Release the role that you play and your titles. It's okay to let go of your religion nationality, even your language. Just let them go. Let go of even the awareness of your body.
What would it be like if I had no name, gender, role, title, religion, language? What would it be like if I didn't have a body that I was attached to? How would I feel? Who would I think of? And who would think of me? I, the soul, will think of the Supreme. And the Supreme would remember me. So in this moment in time, collectively we consciously choose to allow the energy of God's love and light inside. Breathe in deeply and exhale. And simply enjoy the consciousness and the awareness that you have just created for yourself. and share that with others. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you for coming, everyone. And as Sister Jenna mentioned, uh, we do, she has some special treats for everyone. If you'd like to come up, she will present those. And if, if there's still time to, if you want to come outside and uh, visit with Sister Gita, she does have some lovely things on display. And you know, and if you want to be, be so kind, you know, the this organization functions only by donations. So if you're if your heart wills, if you want to make a donation, of course, that's always welcome to help sustain the programs. Again, thank you for coming to all the guest speakers, to Chrysaline, VJ, uh, all the congressional representatives. Thank you all very, very much for our minister from India. Thank you so much. And God be with you. Peace be with you. I could learn who I am.